I have had many wonderful teachers in my life, but the teacher of my life and of life is Nora Tubbs Tisdale. And that is true for so many of us um, in the church. You are blessed beyond measure to have her and to have Tom Troger with you as your preaching faculty. I can't imagine how you guys did it, but well done. The Lord be with you. Okay, some years back, it occurred to me that my job isn't really to teach preaching, not at first, anyway. My job is to get my students to walk straight into a biblical text without stopping, and then to stay there and let whatever happens to them happen, which is harder than it looks. Once you know that scripture is much better at reading you than you are at reading it, you don't always want to hang around to see what the cat or the Lord dragged in today because there is always something, something you were hoping not to have to look at again. It takes nerve to read and be read. This is always a bit of a surprise to my students who thought the primary body part required of them for exegesis would be brain. And they find out that skin, ears, eyes, stomach, blood, guts, and feet that absolutely refuse to turn and run straight out of the text are also intimately involved. I might even argue that we read scripture feet first. How beautiful on the mountain are the feet of those who walk straight into a text and wait for a word to say. In my old theater studies world, down the hill, way down the hill at the college, we called this staying in the scene. It means you don't break character and interrupt the action once it starts just because you don't like how this person said his line or that person made her entrance or because you have a question or a better idea or you want to try your bit again since you know you can do it better and you don't want to brag but hey the whole thing really does hinge on you and your performance right sure sweetheart sure <laughs> staying in the scene is a practical necessity if nobody learned to do it, we could never rehearse. We would also make the unfortunate error, each of us, of believing that there is no ensemble. There is only me alone, the great star in your firmament, me alone around whom all things revolve. My college classmates and I could really fall for that one when we were 19. We had to learn. This is not all about you. So, when a scene starts, you don't stay in it for the sake of what you can do. You stay in it for the sake of what others can do, or might, as the scene unfolds, and how that is going to shape you. So yesterday, I spoke of the need for the church to claim new images and practices for living out a theology of proclamation particularly in communities that find themselves in cycles of dependency, interpretive, interpretively speaking. I said scripture is a perfectly stocked refrigerator and we're hungry, but there's only one person here who knows how to cook. That's the preacher. The rest of us have to wait to be served. Uh, and uh, we never leave home. I proposed that one way through this impasse is to teach the people to cook, so to speak, Envision ourselves as a repertory church called to read and rehearse and proclaim the biblical text as an interpretive body. And to read and interpret it as art, since scripture in one of its modes is art. Set us loose with the biblical texts, tell us to go and rehearse one together, and to come back and show you when we found something true, when we found something true which is what I learned in my old theater studies classes. Now today, our task is to focus on the how of this process, what rehearsing a biblical text actually looks like in the repertory church, 
So I want to add one thing. And no matter how awful the story gets, tell us to stay in the scene until we found a word to say. Because there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord, not even a text of terror. Thirty years ago, for the Lyman Beecher Lectures of 1982, Dr. Phyllis Tribble, the groundbreaking feminist biblical scholar and the first woman invited to give this lecture series, Phyllis Tribble went down to the dusty archives of scripture, hauled up three stories that nobody liked, nobody wanted, plunked them down right here in front of us in Marquand Chapel, I assume it was here, and said, okay, people, we're going in. Follow me. It must have been riveting and hair-raising to have been here that day, as some of you surely were. I bet you needed oxygen masks. Because when Professor Tribble goes into a biblical text, she goes way in. The woman knows how to plant her feet, and she does not scare easy. The title of those Beecher lectures was Texts of Terror, Unpreached Stories of Faith, which is a total dare if I ever heard one. They were later published as Texts of Terror, which became an instant classic and is still sending shock waves through seminary classrooms today. If you have not read the book, it is a companion to Tribble's first landmark work, God and the Rhetoric of Sexuality, which contains literary feminist readings of stories about women in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. But while her first book was celebratory, texts of terror dug into the underbelly of scripture with four often overlooked stories of women, Hagar, Tamar, Jephthah's daughter, and an unnamed concubine. These women have suffered unspeakable violence at the hands of men, including sexual abuse, assault, torture, incest, rape, murder, human trafficking. The book is a lament. It's a crying out. It's a call to repentance. And you don't read it at bedtime. And Tribble is very clear that while these stories are ancient and biblical, they are happening right now in our streets and our homes and our churches today. So it's been 30 years, and I think we may have learned something else from Tribble's work. Just because you walk into a text doesn't mean you're ready to stay in the scene. How many of us have taken her up on her dare and actually preached these texts? Really, I'm interested. Well done, Yale. Okay. Some, but not as many as a progressive wing of the church might hope for, really. And we have not had much encouragement, I will say that. None of these texts is in the lectionary. As far as the ecumenical councils are concerned, we can keep our distance, ignore them all we want. Liturgical police will never cite us for gross negligence of scripture. That means if you want to preach a text of terror, you have to go rogue, take the initiative, grit your teeth, prepare the people, and launch into it. And obviously, you're going to have to talk about Sexual abuse, assault, violence, incest, rape, murder, human trafficking, since that's what the stories are about, right? What else are you going to do with them except talk about the issues they raise? And wouldn't it be my responsibility as a teacher of preaching to encourage you in that, to preach about the violations of justice we find in these texts? It might. But for that sly little preposition, about the one that circles and hops and never quite lands. That preposition can kill a sermon. So no, I can't encourage you to talk about these texts. 
Talk about the issues they raise. Yes, absolutely. Talk about them. Pray about them. Work to end them. Say the words sexual abuse in the pulpit so we know the church can handle it, won't collapse at the very thought like Roman Catholic bishops or Boy Scouts or a few Penn State administrators. But you cannot talk about a text. Scripture is a living word. You have to enter it. With the repertory church, the community of interpretation walking beside you. Otherwise, the text is just something you hold at arm's length and an appropriate distance, as we noted yesterday. It's just something to be exegeted by noted experts or visited with a great tour guide, like Tribble, and then shut back into the pages of a book. After all, if Tribble has said everything there is to say about these texts, then we have no more role to play as preachers except to quote her in our sermons and call it proclamation. I cannot believe that that is what Tribble or any Bible scholar intends for us because we do have an interpretive role that no one else can take for us, and that is to rehearse the verbs the text offers us, which interestingly are a lot more open-minded and one size fits most than you might think. Pretend, would not listen, send in, send out, take hold, force, Bolt the door, tear, cry aloud, keep quiet, speak neither good nor bad, remain, hate. Don't worry about it. We'll give you a moment. Cell phones, the biggest intrusion ever into our lives, yes? no problem. All of those verbs are verbs I know. I wish I didn't sometimes, but I do. I know those verbs. So now I don't get to distance myself with various sorts of literalism like, well, how can I speak about this text since it's not my experience? Well, I've just had an experience with the repertory church caught in the headlights of these verbs. And that may have blessed me, blessed us, blessed you, with a word to say, a word to speak. So what would happen if the repertory church stood on its own, walked into a text of terror, or any other text for that matter, and said, okay, people, we're going in. And we're not leaving until we have figured out which verbs are ours. Because the question is not whether this text names our experience. The question is what experience emerges when we read this text together. How are we going to stay in the scene right here until we find something true to say? And what will the repertory church say about God after we find the script, our script, in this scripture? So here's what we're going to do in the time remaining this morning. We're going to bite a 30-year-old bullet and read a text of terror together as a briefly constituted repertory church. The story we're going to read is from Samuel, 2 Samuel 13. There are copies around if you want to look at it. It's known as the Rape of Tamar. It is one I have been reading for four years with groups around the country and abroad. And I want to tell you is now the first text that my colleague, Matt Fleming, and I read with our preaching students back in Atlanta in the introductory class. It's the first text we read. We don't do it to torture them. We just decided that our students in Atlanta need to know that there is nothing they can't look at in scripture or in the world we live in. And there is no place the word of God can't go. And when they read scripture with the repertory church, there is nothing that can separate them from the love of God in Christ Jesus and this text. 
So I've asked my friend David Kohler, who is here for his 50th YDS reunion, in a few moments to read the text for us, and then I will invite us into a few pieces of it. Ordinarily, for a rehearsal, the way I like to do it, that's a real grand word. We usually just call it reading, but you know, now I'm beachering up. I'm calling it rehearsal. Um, <laughs> Ordinarily, we would go through every verb in the passage. We won't have time for that today, so I will be selective. And in particular, I'm going to focus our attention on the places in the text where the story could have gone differently. We're going to ask, what might have happened if someone had chosen a different verb right here? Now, a word of caution, this is not a pretty story. It stirs deep emotions. And since statistics tell us that one in four girls and one in six boys in the United States will be sexually abused by the age of 18, if that's not epidemic, I don't know what is. That means that a good portion of us sitting here will be connecting with some hard verbs very quickly. So I want to encourage you to notice who is sitting near you. I'm going to ask you right now to do the southern thing and actually turn and introduce yourself to the people sitting near you. Just do it, all right, now. All right, good, 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 good. Now that wasn't so hard, right? Okay, good. And the reason I'm asking you to do that is that it's your job now to look out for one another when we start reading. It is your, if you wanna get up and leave at any point, I say this always, if you wanna get up and leave, don't be embarrassed, go right ahead. There are people out in the hall even who would be glad to sit with you, stuff happens. I'll also tell you that the very first time my colleague Matt and I did this in the introductory preaching class, some of the students got really mad at us afterwards, the men especially. You know what they said? They said, you made us read this story, and we don't like seeing what it does to our sisters. You don't like seeing? Ministry is about seeing things that no one else will look at. Sorry. Texts do things to people. The world does things to people. And if you don't want to see that, what are you doing here? This is your job, I said to them, to see. And the question is now, what are you going to do now that you've seen Second Samuel chapter 13, some time passed. David's son Absalom had a beautiful sister whose name was Tamar. And David's son Amnon fell in love with her. Amnon was so tormented that he made himself ill because of his sister Tamar. For she was a virgin and it seemed impossible to Amnon to do anything to her. But Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of David's brother Shemaiah. And Jonadab was a very crafty man. He said to him, O son of the king, why are you so haggard morning after morning? Will you not tell me? <clears throat> Amnon said to him, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. Jonadab said to him, Lie down on your bed and Pretend to be ill, and when your father comes to see you, say to him, Let my sister Tamar come and give me something to eat, and prepare the food in my sight, so I, that I may see it and eat from her hand. So Amnon lay down and pretended to be ill. And when the king came to see him, Amnon said to the king, Please let my sister Tamar come and make a couple of cakes in my sight, so that I may eat from her hand. Then David sent home to Tamar, saying, Go to your brother Amnon's house and prepare food for him. So Tamar went to her brother Amnon's house, where he was lying down. 
She took dough, kneaded it, made cakes in his sight, and baked the cakes. Then she took the pan and set them out before him, but he refused to eat. Amnon said, send everyone from me. So everyone went out from him. Then Amnon said to Tamar, bring the food into the chamber so that I may eat from your hand. So Tamar took the cake she had made and brought them into the chamber to Amnon, her brother. But when she brought them near to him to eat, he took hold of her and said to her, come, lie with me, my sister. She answered him, no, my brother, do not force me, for such a thing is not done in Israel. Do not do anything so vile. As for me, where could I carry my shame? And as for you, you would be as one of the scoundrels in Israel. Now, therefore, I beg you, speak to the king, for he will not withhold me from you. But he would not listen to her. And being stronger than she was, he forced her and lay with her. Then Amnon was seized with a very great loathing for her. Indeed, his loathing was greater than the lust he had felt for her. Amnon said to her, get out. But she said to him, no, my brother, for this wrong in sending me away is greater than the other that you did to me. But he would not listen to her. He called the young man who served him and said, put this woman out of my presence and bolt the door after her. Now, she was wearing a long robe with sleeves, for this is how the virgin daughters of the king were clothed in earlier times. So his servant put her out and bolted the door after her. But Tamar put ashes on her head and tore the long robe that she was wearing she put her hand on her head and went away, crying aloud as she went. Her brother Absalom said to her, Has Amnon, your brother, been with you? Be quiet, for now my sister, he is your brother. Do not take this to heart. So Tamar remained a desolate woman in her brother Absalom's house. When King David heard of these things, he became very angry but he would not punish his son Amnon because he loved him for he was his firstborn. But Absalom said to Amnon, neither good nor bad, for Absalom hated Amnon because he had raped his sister Tamar. Okay, deep breath in. Deep breath out. Well, good, yeah. All right, turn to the human sitting next to you, near you, check in with each other, give them a hand, give them a hug, give them a kind word, just for a moment. This is hard stuff. Okay, back we come. This is hard, we have to have everyone if we're going to read it. So, the text begins with a short sentence, some time passed. It assumes we know what's just taken place in the chapters before, do you remember? What's taken place? It's a story of David and Bathsheba, which is frequently and bizarrely billed as one of the great love stories of scripture, but we're not counseling our sons to begin their relationships that way. David has just returned from war, victorious. He's doing that post-combat adjustment thing that we all know a lot about these days. Coming home from war is one of the great surreal experiences a human being can have. Yesterday, it was your job to kill. Today, it's life as usual. Back to the commandment, thou shalt not kill. Remember that one? Yeah, sure. Um, so... <laughs> David is back in the palace. He wakes up from a nap one afternoon, looks out the window, sees a beautiful woman bathing, and thinks, I want that. 
Let us note that he has several wives and many concubines by this point. It's not that he doesn't have options. He just wants what he wants. So even though the woman has a husband and is not available, David takes her. Why? Because he can. Because he's the king and has the power to do it. And you know that is exactly what the prophets warned about when Israel started whining for a king. Kings are dangerous. Even a king as golden and righteous as David. Do you know Walter Brueggemann says that David is so irresistible even God can't resist him? Eventually, the prophets warned kings are going to succumb to the temptation of their own power and they will overstep. They will take verbs that belong to God alone. And sure enough, that's what David does. And there is a scandal. Bathsheba gets pregnant. There is a cover-up that includes her husband's murder. And even though Nathan the prophet calls David out on it, the king still gets what he wants in the end. The woman Bathsheba, who you know never says a single word in the entire story. So the first sentence here, some time passed. Who do you think is watching the king during this entire escapade? His offspring. Kids are always watching their parents. They learn from our verbs. Look at that. Dad wanted and took because he could and he got away with it. David's boys are watching. Amnon, the firstborn, and Absalom, number three, by another mother. David's girls are watching too. Tamar, Absalom's sister. They all know what happened. And you might as well cue the ominous music because there is a dangerous precedent on the loose now and the ones who are the most susceptible and vulnerable to it are family. Next verb to highlight. David's son Absalom had a beautiful sister whose name was Tamar and David's son Amnon fell in love with her. Fell in love, that's the verb. As if you never meant to do it, it was an accident. <laughs> you were just minding your own business, it was there on the sidewalk, you tripped, boom, you fell in it, love. And that's oddly accurate. <laughs> you don't plan who you love, you don't wake up one morning and say, today I will fall in love. It just happens without warning. Amnon fell in love. We get that, that is human. So what is the problem? She's his half-sister. She's off limits. He fell in love with the wrong person. Okay, how many of you here have ever fallen in love with the wrong person? <laughs> you don't have to tell. <laughs> I know you have. And if you haven't, you will. It is what human beings do. And it does not matter what age we are or how available we are, it just happens. Ask an adolescent, ask a middle schooler. Middle school is all about falling for the wrong person. Everyone's out of your league. And all of this drama may be fabulous for the music industry because there would hardly be a song on the radio without it, but it is terrible for the one who falls. So here's Amnon. And it's his turn to fall, and to fall for the wrong person. And you might feel for him until you read the next string of verbs. Amnon was so tormented that he made himself ill because of his sister Tamar, because she was a virgin and it seemed impossible to Amnon to do anything to her. Okay, now... Now it's weird, even gross. He fell in love, but he didn't fall sick. He made himself ill, which says to me the man is back in charge of his verbs. And what he chooses to do is to cultivate this, nourish it, feed it like an impossible obsession. 
And why impossible, by the way? Not because she's his sister. That's not what the text says. Because she's a virgin. There will be unmistakable physical evidence. David didn't have to think about virginity with Bathsheba. She was married. But Amnon does with Tamar. He can't do anything to her. That's the verb, do anything. I was reading this with a group of college students once. One young man raised his hand and said, Anna, I hate to say it, but that is how guys talk about girls. Did you do her? That's still our verb. So much for antiquity. Quick sidebar into adjectives. You remember how yesterday we said that adjectives are rare in scripture, so when they appear, you have to pay attention. Here's Tamar's adjective, beautiful. Here's Amnon's, haggard. Big surprise, right? When you make yourself ill, lose sleep, lose weight, sit around stressed and obsessed all day long, that's what you get, haggard. Here's the other thing you get, people notice. They see the change in you. They worry. They ask you, what's wrong? Which is exactly what happens here, right? Jonadab. Uh, uh, Amnon's friend and cousin asks him, son of the king, why are you so haggard morning after morning? Will you not tell me? And Jonadab's concern would be a good thing, except that Jonadab has an adjective too, crafty. Jonadab was a very crafty man. Run that adjective through your biblical echo chamber. Where have you heard that adjective before, huh? Where? Where? Genesis 3, the serpent was very crafty. And now we know all we need to know about Jonadab. The man is a snake. <laughs> so here's the first place where I think things could have gone differently in this story. Jonadab asks, and Amnon tells. And while tell is a good verb to choose, when you fall in love with the wrong person, you have to be careful where you spend it. Tell the right person, and the urge to confide, to share, to bring into the light may lead to honest healing. Tell the wrong person, and a world of hurt is going to follow you. And Amnon tells the wrong person. He tells the friend whose adjective is crafty, not wise. Which means that whatever Jonadab has to say about this situation is going to be as slippery and calculating as he is. Okay, how many of you have ever gotten bad advice from a friend? <laughs> how many of you have ever deliberately gone to the friend that you knew would give you bad advice because you want what you wanted to hear? Yep. What would have happened if Amnon had told the wise friend rather than the crafty friend? Told them he fell in love with the wrong person? What would that friend have said? Oh my God, Amnon, I'm so sorry. Look, we're gonna get through this together because you know, you know this can't happen, right? You know, I'll be with you, we'll get through it. If Amnon had told the right person, the ship could have turned around right there, but he didn't. He told Jonadab, whose advice is only as good as his adjective. Here's what he has to say. Lie down on your bed and pretend to be ill. And when your father comes to see you, say to him, let my sister Tamar come and give me something to eat and prepare the food in my sight so that I may see it and eat from her hand. What a carefully crafted string of verbs so calculated to get Amnon what he wants. Bro, this is so simple. Start with pretend, get your dad in your court, get the girl in your room, bang, she's yours. That's the sort of friend Jonadab is. Tell me the truth, I'll tell you how to pretend. So Amnon does it. And sure enough, here comes King J. David to check on his firstborn. Crown prince can't sneeze without the press going nuts. Look at William and Kate. 
Amnon repeats Jonadab's words almost verbatim with one little slight variation. He says, please let my sister Tamar come and make a couple of cakes in my sight so that I may eat from her hand. He changes food to a couple of cakes. And I wouldn't mention it, except that some nice Presbyterian laymen in Idaho pointed it out to me. Anna, they said, come on, a couple of cakes. Every woman has two sets. <sighs> I get it. <laughs> so now we know that Amnon is beyond obsessive. His verbs, his verbs are getting pornographic in relation to food. He wants her to make a couple of cakes in his sight so he can watch her and eat them, all of them. And this is the next place I think where things could have gone differently. Here it is. David doesn't pick up on his son's slightly stomach-churning request. Or he doesn't want to pick up on it. And part of me understands that because to acknowledge that there is something wrong here is venturing into unthinkable territory. And by definition, we don't gravitate toward the unthinkable, especially with our own children. It's why incest is such a shock to parents, even when all the signs were there. Unthinkable, uns unspeakable, and yet, and yet, and then. Should David have seen the warning signs when Amnon started going on about a couple of cakes? Yes. No. Yes. No. All we have to go on are his verbs. And here's the verb. David sent home to Tamar saying, go to your brother Amnon's house and prepare food for him. An imperative. It's the first one in the text. Go. And not even in person, he sends word. Maybe he doesn't want to see her face. That's what a group of elderly church ladies in Memphis thought when we read this together. We also, in Memphis, noticed how David skips the bit about a couple of cakes in my sight. The command to his daughter is shortened to two words, prepare food, which said to those ladies from Memphis who were so mad by this point that of course David knows he just has to pretend he doesn't. Because what would David really have to do to think the unthinkable about his firstborn? He'd have to look at himself. All his terrible verbs from the previous chapter about Bathsheba. The ones that Amnon has been studying and fantasizing about. Take. Pretend. Send. Come on, Dad. You know what I mean. This is one of those huge moments in a parent's life, and David blows it. He won't step up. And it could have gone differently. But then David would have to do something even harder than confessing to Nathan the prophet. He would have to look at how his actions have shaped his own children. And that takes the courage of a mighty king. Or not. So Tamar went to her brother Amnon's house where he was lying down. She took dough, kneaded it, made cakes in his sight, baked the cakes. Then she took the pan and set them out before him, and he refused to eat. I want you to notice how many verbs it takes to make a couple of cakes. I want you to notice that Tamar has to do every one of those verbs in her brother's sight, including the kneading, which I can only imagine she would gladly have skipped. All those verbs and not a word, she just sets the pan before him, and he refuses to eat. Amnon said, send everyone out from me. So everyone went out from him. This is the next place where I think things could have gone differently. They all got up and left. Servants, most likely his and hers. Even though something is going on here that everyone can smell, everyone can see, maybe they've even seen it coming. Amnon sends and they go. And what would have happened if they hadn't? Yes, there is a serious power imbalance here. 
He has it, the crown prince. They don't, the servants. He gives orders, they obey. And if they don't, they lose their jobs or their heads. And that makes it very complicated because there's a risk factor for someone, no matter what. And who doesn't know what that's like? (laughs) To look the other way because someone told you it was your job. Even in ministry. To leave the room because someone told you, you know what, you're not liable, you're not responsible for what happens here, just do your job over there. And how you feel about it is irrelevant, right? Sorry, ma'am, it's nothing personal, just doing my job. Except that it is personal for her. It's always personal, personal when someone is at risk. And so then you have to ask yourself, are the verbs that could happen to me more dangerous than the ones that could happen to her? And are they more important? And why has my job suddenly turned into a lot of fig leaves that can't cover any of us? I want you to know that Tamar has some verbs of her own, strong ones. She delivers what I think is the most rhetorically perfect argument in scripture, the case against rape, start to finish, in seven irrefutable points. One, no, I'm saying no. Two, you're my brother. Three, we don't do this in Israel. It's not who we are. Four, there's an adjective for it. Here it is, vile. Five, what would happen to me if you did this? I'd be dead to all of us. Six, what would happen to you? You'd be a scoundrel in Israel. And seven, if it's going to happen, at least talk to dad first because we know he will not withhold me from you. Amazing. And it doesn't hold, unfortunately, her argument against Amnon's verbs, which are would not listen, would not listen, and being stronger. As in, he was stronger, so he forced her, because he could. Tamar's next set of verbs, I want to tell you this too, is a breathtaking act of defiance, I think it is, in the aftermath. Amnon puts her out, bolts the door after her, how's that verb, bolts? And goes and she puts ashes on her head, tears her clothes, bolts, uh, uh, goes away crying aloud as she goes. He wouldn't listen before. He won't look afterwards. But she makes sure that everyone else in the palace will. Listen to this. And look at me, and I will make sure your eyes are opened and your ears are opened about who we are now in this palace. There are more heart-wrenching stops to make in this text, places where it could have gone differently. We don't have time. I'm going to only mention two more. After the rape, there is a cryptic phrase. King David heard of these things. He heard, but he chose would not punish because he loved Amnon, his firstborn. And then finally, Tamar's brother Absalom counsels her with this verb. Be quiet for now. He also selects a verb in relation to his older brother, which is the last verse. Absalom spoke to Amnon neither good nor bad. And that's where the story ends. We are left wondering what might have gone differently if the father had punished or the son had spoken up. Perhaps a measure of integrity could still have been restored to this family, this kingdom, this girl. It would have required deeply painful speech and action much harder than David's confession to Nathan, because now we're talking about the atonement of an entire family. But it could have happened, and it didn't. And a few chapters later, these boys of David's are dead on the set, and his beautiful daughter has disappeared. So, now that we've read and rehearsed just a small bit of this text, now that I've made you read it, As my students say, what do we say? What do we do? Where is God in a story where God isn't even mentioned? 
Okay, it is the task of the preacher and the repertory church, I would argue, to say something. Not about how we feel, although we can discuss that. Not about ourselves, although we can share that too. Our task is to say something about God. And even a text that never mentions the holy name is teeming with evidence about who God is. So we listen to what is said, as, to what, as well as to what isn't said, and we enter the verbs that are chosen, as well as the ones that weren't, but could have been. And that is especially important, I think, with a text of terror. If we could not imagine other possibilities than what's written here, we would just crumple under the weight of despair. So God, I really believe, is in the imagining. That is rehearsal. And then it is time for us to speak. So here I go again, practical theologian. I've broken it down into five pieces. It's what my students and I do. First, here's what we do. I ask my students to find the place in the text that really hits them. It may be a word or an image that bothers them, that thrills them, that frightens them, that angers them. But whatever it is, I want them to name that place. I want them to name the verse, locate it, because that, I believe, is the spirit getting your attention. You know, I have lived long enough in the South that I can say that without embarrassment. That is the spirit getting your attention. The place in the text that sticks to you, no matter how hard you try to shake it off, is the place where the sermon begins. It's the seed of your proclamation. And your job at, this mo at that point is not to ignore it. Because if you do, it's just gonna wait till next week. It'll do that, you know. I mean, the text just sort of waits for you to say it. The second move is to name for yourself why this place in the text is really getting you. This is a moment for you personally. You don't have to tell us. You really shouldn't tell us in the sermon, perhaps, but you do have to know. It's your chance to name how the text is reading you today, whether you want it to or not. It's a chance to make connections that are important for you. And again, if you don't, all that stuff is going to come up in the sermon, and your sermon's going to look like me alone, the great star in your firmament, it's all about me. So you better come clean with yourself and get out of the way so God can be the subject and not you. The last three moves follow in sequence, and we ask the questions one after another in turn. What do I know about God now from this place in the text that gets me? Why is it important for my people to hear this today? And now what do I want to tell them? So I want to tell you, since we don't have the opportunity to do this today, normally we would. This would be what we would do next. I want to tell you some of the amazing wisdom I have heard around the wide repertory church when groups of us have read this text. A pastor in Iceland said, the place in the text that gets me is verse 20. Absalom's words to Tamar, be quiet for now. And the reason it gets me, she said, is because our bishop in the Church of Iceland has just been brought up on charges of sexual misconduct, and the women who accused him, including his own daughters, were told, be quiet for now, he's your bishop. And we as a church, we're more worried about our church than about these women. And what I know about God, said this pastor, is that God never sanctions silence as a fig leaf cover-up. God is walking in the woods around every pastor who told those women to be quiet, and God is calling, where are you? So what I want to say, this pastor said, is that you can't ever tell someone to be quiet if you have a stake in the quiet. That is a, as good as a cover-up. And we as a church have to repent. A young Baptist pastor from Texas said, the place in the text that gets me is verse 22. Absalom spoke to Amnon, neither good nor bad. And it gets me, said this young man. He's in the CBF, the Continuing Baptist Fellowship. 
And it gets me, he said, because I look around our Baptist church and I see how some of us never say a word about what's going on. We are so sick of the fighting. We don't want to get involved. We're looking out for our own careers. We know there are consequences to speaking, either good or bad. So we don't say anything. And what I know about God, said this young pastor, is that God calls us to speak truth, not good or bad or what's best for us. So what I want to say is that we in the ba my Baptist church are not the church of Absalom. We are the church of Jesus Christ. A pastor in Sweden said, the place in the text that gets me is verse 14. Being stronger than she was, Amnon forced her and lay with her. And the reason it gets me, this man said, is that a lot of men in my country don't know what it is like to be a man anymore. We don't know. We don't know how to handle the idea that we are often physically stronger than the women we live and work with, but that doesn't entitle us to use our strength against them just because we can. And so we're trying to be sensitive and gentle and strong in other ways. But what do we do with the rage when it comes? And what I know about God, said this pastor of the Church of Sweden, is that God shows us what real strength is. To break the chains of the oppressed. And to set the captives free. And to love and fear and serve the Lord as Jesus did. So what I want to say he said, is that God calls each of us to understand our own strength and how it can be used for good and for ill. And then God calls us to be strong in the Lord and not in our own power and desires. And finally, a young Nazarene pastor in Tennessee said, the place in the text that gets me is in verse 19, when Tamar puts ashes on her head and tears her clothes and goes away crying aloud. And the reason it gets me, she said, is that women are really taught not to make a scene. We're supposed to stuff our pain and our hurt even when we've been violated and never show it in public, never show your wounds, never cry aloud in a way that's going to disturb the peace. And what I know about God, said this young Nazarene woman, is that God calls prophets to cry out. So what I want to say, she said, is that if you are Tamar, whether you're a man or a woman, you can tell us and show us what has happened to you, and we as a community can take it. We will take it. We will bear it. Because if we don't, our church and our nation will fall apart as surely as King David's did. I invite you to think about the place in the text that gets you and perhaps to speak about it to someone in the next day or so. Speak about it. Speak to your old classmates. Reunions are funny things. You bring who you were. You bring who you are now. They aren't always the same thing. So speak to one another about God. Who and where God is for you now in this text in your life. And tomorrow we'll pick up with the why, as in why in the world do we have to go through all this when we would really rather just read the text by ourselves and be done with it? We will talk about that. And I thank you for bearing with us. The Lord be with you. Go in peace.